Steve Horgan, Director of Umpiring, USA Field Hockey. This is our national indoor briefing for the 2013-2014 indoor season. A couple of things we want to talk about before we get started, that this is indoor hockey. This is not outdoor hockey brought indoors. Over time, we seem to have some issues of umpires and players bringing skills and tactics from outdoors indoors. This is a separate game. We need to look at it as a separate game and apply the rules separately from the outdoor game. What we'd like to do now is talk about applying the rules and some of the concerns that the FIH has with some of the rules. We would first like to make sure that everyone understands that the information that we get at USA Field Hockey in applying the rules comes directly from the FIH. We do not worry about what other domestic entities do uh, for their home competitions or their leagues and we know that some folks try to emulate some of the tactics that are happening uh, in other countries. But for our domestic purposes we are going to follow exactly what the FIH gives us to make our domestic matches uh, consistent and understandable to not only the players and the coaches but the parents and the fans that watch the matches. Let's begin by looking at applying the rules and we'll start with 7.4 which talks about intentionally playing the ball over the back line. There's a distinct difference between indoor and outdoor on this one subject. The biggest ramification is if it goes unintentionally off the defense over the back line, the defense retains possession. We all know that in the outdoor game that becomes a long hit and the attack team retains possession of the ball. So if you're in the position of a player trying to defend near the end line, the, the idea that an umpire will possibly give them the ball back if the ball unintentionally goes over the end line gives them a little bit more uh, opportunity to make that happen and more subtly make that happen to the benefit of their team. So let's show a couple of examples of what may or may not be over the end line intentionally. Okay, what we'd like to do is make our best attempt to uh, show the application of Rule 7.4 and from an umpire standpoint as the rule states, if it is clear that the action is intentional, the umpire should not hesitate to award a penalty corner. The problem becomes, in everybody's understanding, is what is clear? What is clear to a player? What is clear to a coach? What is clear to the umpire? So let's try to make an attempt of showing uh, ways that we can make it as clear as possible, even though there is judgment associated with every bit of this rule. What we'd like to do is use this table as part of the field and this end of the table actually being the end line uh, at, with the goal. And as players and the ball comes down the end line, what happens is a defender gets in a block tackling position and sometimes their stick is angled. Almost no matter what the angle is of the stick, if the ball inadvertently deflects off the stick and goes over the end line, we should have no problem with that. This is a simple block tackle. If, for some reason, the defender decides to sweep at the ball with a stick with a forward motion that is definitively going towards the end line, that is the parameters of a penalty corner. The ball should make every attempt to be kept in play. Okay. We understand this, just as the attacker has to come down and be aware of the end line, the defender must be aware of that end line as well when it comes to their actions. So a block tackle would be acceptable with a rebound, a definitive move to hit it over the end line would not. Let me show you something that's been happening that makes it very interesting as to whether something is intentional or not. What we're finding out is in this area, again using the table as the end of our field, we're using the, the left hand side of the goal and a player uh, receives the ball out here on the defensive team heading out so we're basically on the attack from the defense going out and now with the opposing team applying pressure this player in this corner uh, attempts to make a spin move 
your typical spin move to try to send the ball laterally across to their partner. But as they make this spin move, oh my gosh, the ball came off of my stick and went over the end line. So now as an umpire and everyone involved, the decision has to be made as to whether that was intentional or not. Is it intentional? Is it not intentional? That will lead to some inconsistency and you as the umpire have to make that decision. And it must be accepted by everyone in the game so that it now becomes understood that this is not, this is, this can be seen as an intentional act. Let's go on to rule 9.12 which deals with obstruction and basically uh, shielding the ball or stick obstruction. What we'd like to do is show you some examples of shielding the ball that happen typically in indoor that are missed and actually can have an effect on the game. The players play the ball with their stick on the ball quite a bit. But in order to get into a position, in order to send the ball laterally or on an angle, players will put the ball, put their stick in front of the ball and pull the ball backwards. So in that action, as a player is doing that to pull the ball backwards and an opponent comes in and attempts to play the ball, it's a perfect example of the attacking stick shielding the ball from the defending stick and the player not being able to play the ball. Many times we have contact between these two and too many times the umpire gives the free hit to the attacking team when they are actually the one who has done the shielding of the ball from the defending team stick. Let's look at this in, in more detail. If at the time the attacker with the ball decides to place their stick in front of the ball and at that moment the defender comes in and makes contact with the attacking stick, the attacking stick literally is obstructing the defender's stick from playing the ball. When it's in close proximity and in possession or if it's in distant proximity it is still possession if the player puts the ball, their stick out here to pull it and that same contact is made because it's preventing the player, the opponent, from actually playing the ball. Too often as umpires, we tend to give the player in possession of the ball more leeway than the defender. And what happens is when the attacker puts their stick in front of the ball and there's a noise because of stick contact and the ball goes off, umpires tend to give it to the attacker on a stick interference call against the defender. When in actuality, the attacker's stick is placed between the defender's stick and the ball, creating the stick obstruction. Let's go on to rule 13.2, which talks about the stationary ball at a free push. Everyone must understand that Albeit, very briefly, the ball needs to be stopped prior to the free hit being taken. There are two criteria for a free push. One is the ball to be stationary. We know playing on surfaces like our table yeah. and, the, and the, the, the floors that we play on, that can be very difficult. But one of the main requirements is that the free hit be taken within playing distance of where the foul actually occurred. Now that we only have four field players and a goalkeeper or five people on the field versus six that we had last year, some of the indication, early indications that we are getting is that umpires are allowing the ball to roll much further away from where the free hit actually should be taken and allowing players to run onto it and just take it from there. So from an umpiring standpoint and for consistency of understanding for the players, if that ball tends to roll too far away from the spot of where the free hit was supposed to be taken, free push rather, was supposed to be taken, the umpire should be blowing their whistle before the player makes contact with the ball, just a quick toot on the whistle, make them bring it back to near the spot, and we can move on from there. If the ball is within plain distance of where the actual foul occurred, a simple tap on top of the ball, and then they can take off from there. There has to be, the, the reason that this is coming up as a concern from the FIH standpoint, from everything that we understand, is 
there is not a clear indication of when the free hit or free push has actually been taken. All we see is a player running off with the ball. And when that happens too far away from where the actual free push should have been taken, it leads to a confusion on not only the player's part who are expecting it to be set up in a certain area, but on the coach's part and the umpire's part because now we run the risk of being too lenient and allowing too much flow in contradiction to the actual to the actual rule itself. Just to clarify, it is not mandatory for a player to actually tap the ball or put their stick in front of it to make the ball motionless. A player may step on it, the ball may be spinning, or within a revolution or so of the ball, uh, of the ball moving, a player can run up and we can take the free hit. The idea and the the emphasis from the FIH is to make sure that the that there's an indication to everyone that the free hit has actually free push has actually been started. Okay, let's review Rule 9.8 that talks about danger. Players must not play the ball dangerously or in a way which leads to danger. What's considered dangerous? Danger should always be considered if a player has to take legitimate evasive action. And that means they would have been hit or very close to being hit, and it is a true get-out-of-the-way evasive action type of movement. Not the ones that players sometimes try to entice the umpire to call danger when there was no chance of them being harmed in any way. This happens especially on shots on goal when players are playing legitimate defense. Uh, obviously the player who's protecting the post, they're putting themselves there. We all know the parameters of that when it comes to a penalty stroke. We run more into an issue when players are actually trying to play legitimate defense. There is nothing in the rules, and let's make this quite clear, there is nothing in the rules that says any shot at goal is free to go through anybody, anywhere, anytime. If a player is playing legitimate defense, the attacker does not have the right to shoot through them. If that player who is playing legitimate defense has to evade the ball to prevent from being hit, danger should be called. If they do not, and the ball, lack of better wording, goes by, whizzes by them, and they have no reaction to it because the player was skilled enough to get it in the back corner of the goal, then it's, we cannot be over conservative with this and call danger just because the ball was in the air. Legitimate, evasive action should be your key to danger on lifted shots. In Rule 9.8, the FIH has defined what we call drilling, which is good news for us. Playing the ball deliberately and hard into an opponent's stick, feet, or hands with associated risk of injury when a player is in a set position and players collecting, turning, and trying to play the ball deliberately through a defender who is either close to the player in possession or trying to play the ball are both dangerous actions and should be dealt with under this rule. A personal penalty may also be awarded to offending players, i.e. a card. Let's take a look at the FIH umpire briefing and the direction given to the umpires at international tournaments about drilling. We want to make sure that everyone understands that both of these actions are dangerous and should be penalized accordingly. First and foremost, playing the ball hard deliberately into an opponent's feet, stick, or hands. Pretty much within the body frame. Because of the rounded part of the stick where the ball can bounce up, hit somebody in the face who is in a low set position, this is considered extremely dangerous and umpires should be uh, penalizing this quickly and consistently to prevent it from happening throughout the match, i.e. use a card if necessary. The other action is players who collect the ball and immediately turn and try to run through an opponent who is down, again, in a set position trying to block tackle. That is extremely dangerous as well and umpires must penalize that accordingly. We'd like to go over two major changes associated with the rules for the upcoming season. First, 
six players down to five. Maximum of five players on the field. All the parameters uh, of last year are the same where you can play with four field players and a goalkeeper, four field players and a kicking back, or five field players in any match. The second one is substitutions. Goalkeeper substitutions will take place at the center line, just like every other substitute, substitution associated with the game. Time will not stop for goalkeeper substitutions. Again, the parameters are the same. The goalkeeper must be off in the proper area before the other player comes on. Whether it's a fully kitted goalkeeper coming on, or a kicking back coming on, or a field player coming on. The substitution of goalkeepers is the same as everyone else associated with the match. Let's finish up with going over the 2014 National Indoor Tournament rules developed by USA Field Hockey in conjunction with a newly formed uh, Tournament Rules Advisory Committee that has been made up of coaches, players, umpires, and administrators. There are a few changes from 2013 that we'd like to go over. First, each team must have a captain. The captain must be indicated with either an armband or a sock band that indicates that they are the captain. This is mandatory. This is, there is no leniency to this. Our second point is the goggles. The caged goggles are not allowed at USA Field Hockey events. The, the sunglass type or the plastic ones that are flat and form-fitting to the face are fine. Caged goggles are not allowed. Let's go on to our third point, the stick. The stick and bow rules will still apply. We've eliminated the need or the requirement for a stick to actually say indoor on it or for it to be designed for indoor. The parameters of the outdoor stick and the indoor stick in both rule books is exactly the same. There are a number of other changes associated with the tournament rules for the upcoming year. Please take the time to review the document in its entirety for those administrative changes. The document can be found at usafieldhockey.com. If you have any questions associated with the rules, please feel free to email us at umpire at usafieldhockey.com. We'd like to thank the Tournament Rules Advisory Committee for their input into the rules of this season. We want to thank you all for watching, and we wish you the best of luck in the indoor upcoming season and at the National Indoor Tournaments of 2014.